Hi, I'm Abadesi Osinsade. I'm here to represent. Please, can you tell us about your early career and how it got you to where you are today? So I started doing this work because I myself faced the problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, when I graduated university, I actually worked in the city um, because those are the only jobs around in a recession. Um, and I ended up in the startup world maybe a couple of years after graduating. And it was in the startup world that I really decided tech was for me. But having worked in the startup world for a few years, rising up the ranks, I eventually found myself like in a leadership position in a startup, but being the only black person in that office, being like one of the few people of color in the whole company, I really started to realize the negative effects of a lack of inclusion personally. And that's when I decided to start my company, Hustle Crew, which is focused on making the tech industry more inclusive. What barriers have you faced and overcome as a woman in tech? I think a lot of the barriers that I face, unfortunately, are still there, but I would definitely say that one of the most damaging things that happens in our male-dominated field of tech is just assumptions about women's capabilities, assumptions about roles, assumptions about, you know, who's the manager here, who's the leader here. I can think of a number of times over my startup career when I was in a sales position, like selling the startup I was working for, and I would arrive at a client office ready to pitch to the business and they would sort of sit around waiting like you know when's you know when's your other company representative coming and I would say I'm I'm the only one I'm here to sell you our startup and tell you all about it and you know unfortunately we're still living in a world where people are judged on face value and when you're moving through the tech industry looking like me people don't see that many tech leaders or tech CEOs that look like me maybe the only people they've seen who look like me are in a support role or you know certainly not like the head of operations or you know the country manager so I definitely have had to get over that feeling of imposter syndrome that you get when people look at you and go like oh you can't be this qualified person it's like actually I am um, but it's really really difficult and even though I'm more senior in my career than I was 10 years ago you know there are still days where people judge me at face value even as a vice president and it's really really hard and I think one of the things that I always turn to is just community because when I feel like one of the only people of my race of my gender within my company it can be really nice to go into communities where I'm actually like feeling seen and heard. How can companies avoid tokenism of women in their tech team? I think it's really important for like any individual who's concerned about tokenism to actually like unpack what it means for them and like what they're concerned about in that. You know, I think about some of the first women who entered the workforce in the war. Um, and, you know, that was a time where the country needed women. And so women got out of the homes and got into the factory. And at that time, I don't think those women were thinking about like why they were being called there. They were just knew that they needed to be there. And I think that's unfortunately true of many of the people who find themselves being token today. Maybe you're the only gay woman at your level. Maybe you're the only disabled woman at your level. Maybe you, you are representing something and it doesn't feel anything more substantial at this stage. But if you're not there, who will be there? Just another man, just another cis white dude. Um, you know, I think we have to be really, really careful about what we give our attention to. And if we're focused on progress and impact, then let's give our attention to things that make progress and make impact. An observation that I find is that like, anything that gets women into the space, we put like extra scrutiny on like, oh, well you are a woman, but maybe you're just a token woman, or maybe you're not the right kind of woman. Men aren't being asked to answer these questions. Men are just getting all the good jobs and getting all the money and like raising that pay gap. So um, like, I don't really feel like I have anything more to say on that. I, I feel like there are much more important things we should be talking about. Like why are men not like leaving positions of power? What advice would you give any woman wanting to find a mentor? I would probably say in my case, the best mentors I've had, I've never met. I would say that Brene Brown's been an incredible mentor for me, just being able to read her book, watch her videos on YouTube. I would say that, you know, the entrepreneur, actor, writer, Oprah Winfrey has been an incredible mentor to me. Again, never met her, never met her. She may not know who I am, probably doesn't. Um, but she's provided such valuable advice to me in times where I've needed them. And I think too many of us are obsessed with the idea of having the kind of mentor we have when we're at school, someone who's like office we can go into, sit on a comfy armchair, they'll make us a cup of tea and we can cry our heart out. Well, the people who you really want to mentor you in the tech industry, in the professional industry, they're too busy to make you a cup of tea and invite you, you know, into a comfy sofa to like spill your beans. So, you know, you have to be realistic. And I think, um, you know, if you are having your heart set on getting someone who, you know, can mentor you in real life, in your organization, in your city, then you need to think about what you can offer them. 
because you know a lot of us especially when we're starting out unfortunately like we still have the mindset of children and we're kind of waiting for a grown-up to come and tell us what to do and who to be and you know once you're a big bad adult unfortunately you're surrounded by other big bad adults going out trying to fulfill their dreams so yeah I would say to me like the best mentors are the ones who you can access on demand through the content that they produced and then the next best mentors are people who you can get something out of but you can also give something to them what advice would you give any women trying to balance family commitments and a career in tech? I don't have children, I have to be honest about that, but I do think it's really important for parents in the workplace to like advocate with other parents for the things that they need. And I do think, you know, unfortunately, because there have been so few chief executive officers who are also primary caregivers or even secondary caregivers, you know, we're living in this workplace where it's not really been designed with the needs of any type of caregiver in mind, whether you're a parent or whether you have like other dependents, you know, relying on you. So I do think it's really important to work with the parents in your organization to campaign for the changes that you need and never tire of talking about how hard it is to be a parent because people forget stuff very easily, especially when it's not their lived experience. And if it's important to you, you have to be willing to repeat it often. So repeat the need for flexible work, repeat the need for a better parental leave, repeat the need for any other benefits you think are important, like, you know, childcare support, why not? Campaign for a creche. Gosh darn it, if there were more female CEOs, there would be nurseries and offices. In your experience, what perks and benefits have a direct impact on employee retention? I definitely think companies should be crowdsourcing from, you know, their target market, their employees, like how can we improve your experience at work? Like I know that companies deal with constraints like budget, um, you know, legacy providers, if they're already working with a benefits provider. But yeah, I definitely think most leadership teams should probably be willing to like look around the room and kind of recognize like where they have similarities in lived experience and also like where they have gaps. Like what are the lived experiences within our employee base that are not represented in this group of decision makers? Like how many of us even have kids here? How many of us, you know, have kids with special needs? How many of us, um, you know, have like a parent at home or not? Like how many of us are like single parents? Like all this kind of stuff they should be asking and if they can't say yes, to every possible scenario, then they need to go to people who are dealing with that scenario and build the solution for them. Like too often in our world, especially in tech, which is like pretty ironic, um, we like design policies for people without like asking them what they need. Like you would never build software along those lines. Like I would never try and conceive a software solution for someone completely different to myself unless I'd done that research. You know, I really tried to understand like what is gonna be your experience of this as a user? How can I make this really amazing for you? That's how we would approach building a tech product. So when it comes to the policies within our tech companies, like we should do the same thing. How can companies increase representation of women in their tech teams? A lot of research shows that you're more likely to have women applying for the job when you put the salary range on it. And a lot of employers are still extremely reluctant to actually say how much the job pays. I, I don't understand why in some countries in the US, for example, states like New York have actually made it, you know, part of the law now. You cannot advertise a job to New York residents unless you're putting the salary band on it. This is the kind of transparency that we need. It's 2022, not like 1952. So, you know, put the salary band on the job description. It's not a big deal. And it's so important because, you know, we need to close the gender pay gap. It's accelerating like crazy. Uh, the pandemic made it a whole lot worse. Uh, the last statistic I read said something like at the current pace of change, it would take like hundreds of years to close the gender pay gap over like 120 years. I don't wanna wait that long. I know the women watching this don't wanna wait that long. So yeah, I feel like putting salary bounds on job descriptions is the revolution we need. What are your thoughts on unconscious bias during the interview process? Wherever there's ambiguity in a decision-making process, bias wins. And when you start to think of it that way, you start to realize, oh my God, there's ambiguity in everything. Like, how are we taking our notes as we speak to this candidate? What are we assessing this candidate on as we go through the interview? When we actually meet after the interview as a group of interviewers, how are we deciding whether it's candidate A or candidate B? Like, is this like a rigorous process with like a very consistent way of collecting evidence and a very consistent way of assessing that evidence to then make a decision? Or do we abandon all the structure that we put into our notes, into our documents, and actually just get into like, a heated debate that's completely based on our emotions and our feelings and none of that 
consistently collected evidence that we gathered so you know it's all about trying to remove ambiguity like you really want to be able to say i have made a decision about this based on these pieces of evidence based on these justifications for the role very few of us do that you know we might have the best intentions but the impact of the actual decision is a decision that's been laced by our own personal preferences maybe we have affinity towards one of the candidates so that's our affinity bias showing or maybe we've leaned into this idea of like you know the halo effect like they did one amazing thing right at the start of the interview and now we've just completely decided they're the one we stop paying attention to some of the mistakes they made later on in the interview you know there's the horns effect as well sometimes someone shows up a bit late or a bit disheveled or I don't know they're like wearing a color you don't like and for some reason you can't, can't put your finger on it you don't really want to work with them you know when we abandon consistency ambiguity starts to play a role and that's where bias wins so yeah make sure you're also being extremely diligent in how you gather evidence and use that evidence to make a decision what can employers do to alleviate imposter syndrome amongst new staff one of the things that I think is really important to do is just like challenge narratives that like are just not true but perpetuate the status quo or like perpetuate the idea that like the world is the way that it is because we want it to be. I don't want to live in a world where men are paid more than me for the same job. I don't want to live in a world where men are like the default people picked to lead, to be promoted, to run venture backed companies. I choose to not live in that world. That's why I'm doing this kind of work. And I think what's really important for all of us to do is actually try to understand like why does imposter syndrome exist in the first place? You know, there's a lot of really interesting interesting research around things like performance bias and attribution bias. Due to outdated gender roles, we actually assume that men perform better in the workplace and women perform less well. And then related to that, we actually attribute success in the workplace more to men and we disproportionately attribute failure to women. So the first part is we got to know these things, right? We as companies, as individuals have to be willing to say things like, hey, I think affinity bias is playing a role here. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, you keep interrupting Emma. But I myself, James, have not been interrupted once in this meeting. Like, stop interrupting women. Like, let them finish their points and maybe interrupt me a little more because I'm talking too much in this meeting. That's like my dream man uh, somewhere out there talking like that. But yeah, you know, <laughs> we need to be willing to like rececognize why the workplace is so unequal still, like so uneven. And ultimately, the people with the most power and privilege, men, members of the dominant groups, can play a really exciting and pivotal role here by kind of, you know, recognizing like how much airtime am I taking up in this meeting? Like how many opportunities have I been given to lead something? Is it time for me to like, you know, give a bit of that privilege to somebody else? But, you know, all, like all of these little things can add up to like a really great movement, a really great huge movement of women finally getting the opportunities that they deserve and finally being able to excel in those opportunities and really starting to believe, wow, I am capable. I can do this, I deserve more, and I should have more. What strategies can be used to empower staff and encourage upskilling? I think a lot of the conversations we have around like justice and equality like always put the emphasis on the group affected by the problem. We very rarely turn the spotlight on the people creating the problem. So the other way to ask this question is like, you know, not what else can we do to empower women? It's what else can we do to like remove the things that are creating problems for women in the first place? That's a far more interesting question. Like, why do women need to be empowered? Why do women need to be empowered? Why do I need to be empowered? Well, the reason I need to be empowered is because sometimes I'm facing toxic behavior from people who do not share my lived experience. I face toxic behavior from men who say sexist things to me, or I face toxic behavior from racist people who touch my hair without my permission and don't see anything wrong with that. So in that situation, what's gonna solve that situation more quickly? Is it going to be giving me power? Or is it going to be telling the person who's touching my hair without my permission, hey, excuse me, don't do that to her. Like, let her get on with her work. So, you know, I'm really interested in like, you know, how are we framing these questions? Because the way we frame the question is the way we look at the problem. And we're still looking at the problem like it's our responsibility to fix it. I didn't make a patriarchal society. I, I did not choose to live in a patriarchal society. I did not choose to assume that because a man is taller than a woman, he should be a CEO. That logic seems dumb to me. And yet study after study after study shows if you're over six foot, you are more likely to be a CEO in America. So, you know, a lot of the world doesn't make sense. A lot of the reasons why women are like facing issues at workplace don't make sense. Yet we're being asked to come up with these like perfectly, you know, argument proof reasons for why things need to change. That in itself is a problem. Playing devil's advocate is a problem. Like, let's just focus on the results we're driving to, smaller pay gap, more representation, and do everything within our power to get there. 
that's the problem. Like the problem is we don't want things to change. If more people wanted things to change, the change would happen. People said we couldn't work from home and then suddenly we had to and everyone could and capitalism kept going. People said like we couldn't go into space and become an interplanetary species. Giant penises are flying into the sky all the time thanks to tech billionaires. So all the things that we thought we couldn't do, we somehow seem to be able to do except listen to women, believe women, pay women properly, stop shouting at women, stop harassing women, stop abusing women. We just like those things too much to let them go. So, you know, I'm not interested in how we can empower women. I'm interested in who's taking our power away and how we get rid of them. That's really important. So work needs to get rid of all the bad apples. It needs to get rid of all the toxic people. I don't care if they're high performing. If they don't align with your values, get them out. And, you know, listen to the women in your company. Just listen to them, believe them. It's really not that hard. It's just, we don't want to do it. We want to believe men, even when they change their minds all the time. But when it comes to believing women, it's just, oh, I just, oh, I just, I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to believe you. And I think that's the problem. And it starts at home. It starts when we're kids. It carries on until we're at work. And then we're all grown ups trying to worry about why women don't have the power that they do.